This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, my name is Josh Toth. This is Dr. Marty Baker. He's the senior pastor at Burke Community Church. And today we'll be talking about what is truth. Get sit in a coffee shop Oh, I just had free. a conversation with a, well, a mother about her sur- son who's studying to be a surgeon, all of his philosophical questions. Mm-hmm. Anyway, okay, that, that took up part of my morning. Yeah. But, Interesting. Were they? Did they approach you with questions? He did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's having a crisis of faith. Okay. Do you find you get more questions from people like who are coming from the faith, or people who are like not convinced of the faith? Hmm. Well, it's 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 probably probably sixty forty sixty percent are Christians. Okay. Because that's what's predominantly here. Yeah. But I, I had an investment broker in my office the other day, mm. former Marine, very successful guy, not a Christian, yeah. had a whole bunch of questions. His wife couldn't answer who is a Christian, so mm. she brought him in my office and said he needs to talk to somebody about these questions. So we started going through all the questions. I answered all the questions, and then after a while, he's like, uh, you've heard these before, haven't you? And mm. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah. He said, man, I thought these were just questions that were just my questions. Yeah. I go, well, no, they're the kind of questions that non-Christians ask. Yeah. So, yeah, there's answers to all those questions. Does it, is it like refreshing every time you can answer someone and be like, mm-hmm. yeah, I've answered this before. And, and when they're, when they connect that these are questions everyone has and mm-hmm. they don't feel the as. questions I've had. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Anyway. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So you're just constantly, you know, talking to people. Yeah. That's really know, cool. Helping them along, like helping the surgeon understand, you know, a proper worldview as opposed to an improper worldview. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And, he's, and he's Christian, but he's, he's, you know, got questions, but he doesn't know where to go find the answers, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah. But anyway, so you're there to kind of help him uh, understand how to find answers. Yeah. Well, I think the toughest yeah. part is knowing you have questions and not knowing maybe what they are, if you just have the sense of uncertainty, you know, I think that's where doubt is really like dangerous because it just becomes this cloud of, oh, I don't, there's no way of knowing, I don't know, I don't even know what I'm asking. So being able to talk with someone, even if you don't yeah. know what the questions are, and um, yeah, that's- Well, that doesn't, that's not usually the kind of person that comes talks to okay. me. It's usually a person, high functioning, educated kind of person with a mm-hmm. ton of questions. Yeah. You know, and they, Sometimes they have them written out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I mean, there are a few that don't really know what they're asking, but but they're not the norm. Okay. Most people know exactly what their questions are that bother them. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, okay, what are those questions? But they're questions I've asked mm. over the years myself. So, you know. Do you ever feel caught off guard with a question? Uh, no, not usually. Yeah. You know, because... As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun mm-hmm. in Ecclesiastes 1. So most questions are like, well, that's been articulated before. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. I'm pretty much at this stage after, what, 34 years of pastoring, kind of unchockable, mm-hmm. you know, because I've pretty much heard everything. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah. Now, some questions are thorny and they're hard to work through. Mm. So, but anyway. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, but I've read a lot, so I know, like, you know, like where people can go to find answers to some of those more complex questions. Yeah, you that's know? yeah. Do you how often do you articulate here's here's an answer versus saying oh there's a book on this or here's a well I usually tell them what the answer is and then I tell them where they can find the answer and like with the surgeon uh, he went to a Christian school Trinity mm-hmm. okay. Uh, which taught him a certain type of apologetic, mm. uh, but he didn't, under, he didn't understand. So in a medical world, that method they taught him there doesn't fly in that medical world. Interesting, okay. Because it's too Bible-centered. Oh. So since that method is refuted by the medical world, they, they don't accept the Bible as truth. So they you know, they just laugh him out of the, the room on that one. Mm. So he doesn't know how else to respond. Yeah, you know, but when I tell him, oh, there's three other different apologetic methods you could use mm. that have that are not biblical approaches. He's like, it's a eureka moment. Yeah, he's like, you're kidding me. So if you want to talk about truth, 
you got three other methods you can use to talk about truth that aren't validated by your holy book. Mm. So yeah. then you can build a bridge to your medical friends in ways that will more appeal to them. Yeah, so he's asking, so what, what do you answer someone who, who has a faith and knows that the Bible is true, but is challenged by people who aren't gonna have that common ground? Yeah, because, because that, that, that guy's approach is the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because he went to Christian school. Mm -hmm. And so when he tries to use the Bible in a secular setting with other would-be surgeons mm -hmm. who are not coming from that viewpoint and the Bible's not a source of truth, he doesn't know how to refute them or how to guide them toward the Bible. Mm -hmm. So he's in a quandary. Mm -hmm. And since they keep hammering him from all sectors, then he then he's like, well, what do I do? You know, maybe, maybe my faith's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, so anyway, so... So at that point, you you try to reassure him that uh, everything's okay. You mm -hmm. just have to mature in your stra your strategy. Mm -hmm. That you've been taught one method when there's four methods to defend the faith, uh, and that's that's usually an aha moment to that person. Mm -hmm. that, well, what are the other methods? You know. Yeah. So he he's he's taught what is called presuppositionalism, mm -hmm. which teaches that the Bible is the source of all truth. And it is. Okay, yeah. And it is the standard of measurement, you know, for what is truth, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. I believe that and can demonstrate why the Bible's an unusual book and mm -hmm. why it is the book of truth uh, regarding uh, spiritual life and et cetera. Um, but the world doesn't believe that. Mm -hmm. So in his, in his medical culture, I wouldn't start there. Mm -hmm. So it's telling him you you need to move over to method one for the pursuit of truth, which is a classical approach to apologetics, which merely ask, can we know truth? Mm -hmm. What is truth? Is truth knowable? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to learn all the argumentation over there in method one, uh, which can help him in his, his world because he can talk about that method to his comrades all day long because mm -hmm. uh, it's at their level. Because yeah. you're talking more philosophically, you're talking uh, more about logic and reasoning and, and those types of things. Mm. That's a great place to start with them, asking them Socratic kind of questions. Yeah. And is it possible to know absolute truth? How, how, how should we define absolute truth? How do we measure what is truth? Mm. How do we know what is false, et cetera? He can ask them questions and eventually yeah. move them toward, there is a God who is the absolute measurement of what is truth. Mm. But he doesn't start there. Yeah. So classical apologetics, is you know starting with the basic things mm -hmm. you know why is there something rather than nothing where did morality come from why are there morals mm -hmm. why are morals very similar between between all cultures and so a classical project starts over there and then the second method that he would need to learn is evidentialism evidentialism shows the evidences for uh christian positions mm -hmm. like so if christ really did rise from the grave then that changes everything mm -hmm. if that happened in time and space history Mm. So, what are the what are the uh, extra biblical references? At references outside the Bible that prove he rose from the grave. Mm. What are the biblical references that he rose from the grave? Because I don't validate the truth of the resurrection just based on the biblical account. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other extra biblical accounts that speak of the resurrection from you know Roman historians, etc., uh, Jewish historians like Josephus, etc. Mm -hmm. So I build a case for the the historicity of the resurrection based on extra biblical biblical references and i give that evidence uh to someone who wants to know did christ really rise from the grave well here yeah. are the evidences mm -hmm. and then is it logical to believe these evidences or not logical to believe these evidence and so that's the second method third mm -hmm. method is presuppositionalism his method the bible okay and then fideism is the fourth method which is the faith statement that your faith that saved you has radically changed you mm -hmm. and your changed life that now lives for God is a great evidence that some divine power has done this for you, mm -hmm. which, you know, my best friend that spent uh, half his life in San Quentin penitentiary mm -hmm. uh, as a felon got saved in there, uh, got out. I got him a job working with me when I was first married 42 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and discipled him for a year before I went to seminary. Um, Alan was a new man in Christ, mm. you know, but he was covered in tattoos, knife wounds, you know, long stringy hair, scary looking dude, but he mm -hmm. loved Christ. Yeah. But he, the, the faith argument for him was totally powerful because all of his gangster buddies are like, dude, what happened to you? Yeah. 
uh, well, he met Christ in prison, you know, and now he's a new man. Mm. So he, it, his his life change is an argument for it. There must be a God who moved Alan out of, you know, it, you know, trying to murder people, shoot people, mm. rob people, uh, deal with drugs, take drugs. I mean, he left all that behind to follow Christ. Yeah. So that's that argument. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I told that surgeon to be, uh, well, talking, I was talking with his mother, but I talked to him earlier uh, by email, but just telling him there's four methods. Mm -hmm. You've only been do using one method. Mm -hmm. So your friends are attacking method three as a source of truth. Mm. And then they refute your book. Well, then what do you do? Well, there's, yeah. you know, so you just need to learn how to think differently. Yeah. And, and I that, bet. that takes a while. So, you know, I told him I've read thousands of pages on said subject so I can help you mm. not waste your time as a medical student. Yeah. Uh, read this. Don't waste your time with that. And, you know, I can coach you along to help you get this, these other methods in your head mm. and other strategies. Yeah. That you can use. Yeah. And so he, that's that's what they get excited about, mm. and yeah. that's that's what's fun is showing people those things, because they're like, well, I, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, and I bet I mean, as a believer who like grew up in the church, I think I'm sure it's almost freeing in some way to realize like, hey, you don't need to prove it to them via the Bible first, because that's not a common ground to say like, you know, use other evidences because because it's true, it's true, and it's evidenced outside of just scripture. And so if someone's right. like. Well, I grew up with this and everyone around me believed it. And so like, hey guys, this is what I believe. And they're like, uh, no, that's dumb. You know, you, and that can be destabilizing if you're like, this is all I'm standing. You know, right. the only evidence I, you know, I, I hold to. Yeah. Or argument. I mean, yeah. The Bible claims to be the book of truth. And mm. so, um, how do I know it's God's book? Mm. You know, you know, well, in a medical community, you can't start there. You need to start with the fact of, is there a God? Mm -hmm. Is there a divine being? Mm -hmm. That's method one. Yeah. So how do I know there's how do I know there's a divine being? Yeah. Well, all of the arguments that are you can put together philosophically to guide a person toward divine belief, and there's many of them. You present those in method one. Mm -hmm. Method three is looking at the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Is well, then how do I validate the Bible if there is a God? Method one. Yeah. And I can give you great reasons for why that's the most logical position. Mm -hmm. Then. Then method three is, well, if there's a God, then he could have spoken. Yeah. Well, if he spoke, how would I know which holy book is his? Mm -hmm. Well, then that's a whole nother thing. So, yeah. so of all of the so-called holy books in the world, what would you expect them to contain if they were from God himself, who's mm -hmm. outside of time and space? And so when you look at the Bible as the source of truth, as opposed to that which is not true, uh, it is the only book of all holy books that prophesies with specificity. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking extreme specificity. So mm -hmm. um, hundreds of years before the fact, uh, you know, the rise and fall of kings, rise and falls of nations, naming the, you know, Cyrus was named as king of Persia to deliver Israel from a, a Babylonian bondage, mm -hmm. you know, like 120 years, I think, before he act ever even showed up. Yeah. I mean, you can't even pick stocks from day to day that yeah. are going to do well. Yeah. So God does a lot of in-your-face prophecies to statistically show you it's impossible for these to be been known by man because Cyrus, king of Persia, Persia didn't even exist as a major power in 539 BC when he freed the Jews. Mm -hmm. So how could it even, you couldn't yeah. even like geopolitically put it together. Yeah, there's no guess. No, so yeah. so if you look at the scriptures, the scriptures validate themselves based on the prophetic value of the scriptures. Mm. They show you that, that they are truth because it matches reality. Yeah. What is truth? Truth is that which matches reality. The Bible yeah. claims to be the holy book of all holy books. Well, how do I know that? Well, it doesn't just have good moral teaching in it, which it does, mm. but it does things that you would expect that only God could allow it to do. Mm regarding time and space. So how can it predict, like in the book of Daniel, chapter two and chapter seven, how can it predict the rise and fall of major world empires hundreds of years before they ever hit the planet mm. and, and they fell in exactly the order as prophesied with great specificity by Daniel? There's no way a man could know these things. Mm -hmm. God had to have told him. Yeah. So it's just things like that. Um, the prophecy of how uh, the fortress Tyre would fall, 
mm-hmm. uh, it w- it fell exactly like God said it was. There was mm-hmm. Tyre on the coast, and there was Tyre out on the island, and there was a there was a kingdom that nobody could defeat the Tyre Tyrene uh, fortress. But but when it fell, it was prophesied that uh, causeway would be built. Uh, you know, out, you know, and it would be attacked and everything. This is exactly what Alexander the Great did. Mm. I mean, to the letter. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah. there's no way these could be known hundreds of years before the fact because the the Grecian Empire wasn't a world power. Yeah. I mean, and so that's where you start looking at those things going, there's only, God had to have spoken mm. to Daniel. Yeah. You know, to Isaiah and gave him the details because they're so exact, mm-hmm. only God, who is omniscient by definition of who He is, could have told these things. Yeah, I mean, it's like pre- predicting 21st century politics of America in the 1600s. It's like yeah. I can't, I don't know who could have done that five years ago. But so you know, so in classical apologetics, you have to you have to first decide: is there truth worth even talking about? Mm-hmm. So what is truth? Tr- truth corresponds to reality. Uh, it matches reality. So the mm. Bible claims to be the essence of all spiritual religious truth. How do I validate it? Mm. Well, I test it. Yeah. You know, uh, does it contradict reality? Uh, no, it verifies reality. Mm. You know, so when I look at like uh, the Book of Mormon, um, the Book of Mormon claims to be a holy book, but the Book of Mormon doesn't match the flora and fauna uh, of uh, upstate New York where it claims to come from, mm. uh, it, it details huge Indians uh, groups that fought against each other um, in massive battles. Mm. They've, they have found no uh, arrowheads, they found no spearheads, they have mm. found no ostrica, no pottery. They found nothing from these giant Indian tribes that supposedly lived in the Camorra area of New York. You can't validate the story. It doesn't mm. match the geography, doesn't match the flora and fauna. They find no archeological evidence mm. at all. Yeah, but when I take people to Israel on tours, and we go to uh, Solomon's Fortress of Megiddo in the Valley of Armageddon, um, go to any one of these, and you, <laughs> there's the history. Mm. It matches what the Bible says happened. Mm. The flora, the fauna, the geography, etc. You can is a one to one correlation. It's yeah. it's telling you the truth. Yeah. It corresponds to the facts. Mm. That's the correspondence view of truth is I can verify it by testing it. Yeah. So, so the good doctor to be, you know, can use the Bible as the power of the word of God. It has mm-hmm. great power. God says it won't return void if used, mm-hmm. no doubt. Yeah. Um, and there's great reason to believe it's God's book because mm-hmm. no other book on the planet has the prophetic insight that it does. Yeah. None. And I've read a ton of holy books mm-hmm. and they don't do this. Yeah. So... When you're looking at truth, you know that's that's how you you can verify whether the Bible's should I believe it? Mm. Well, mathematically, it's impossible for the prophet prophets to foretell these things. Mm. I mean, how did how did Daniel know? Uh, you know, when he's carried away in captivity in 605 BC, uh, how did he know the Babylonian Empire, the major power of the earth, uh, is going to be overthrown? Uh, you know, by the the Medes and the Persians. How, how, how did he know that? Yeah, you know, and how, and then, and then, how did he know that that the Persian Empire would be overthrown by the Alexandrian Empire? How did he know that? Mm-hmm. And then, because Alexander's empire wasn't a great empire, and then, how did he prophesy the the rise of the Roman Empire after the demise of the Grecian Empire? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, he even prophesies how Alexander's empire broke up an, uh, among his, his uh, I think it was his three generals after mm-hmm. his death. How do you know that? Mm-hmm. God had to tell him. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and then how did, he, how did he foretell the rise of the Roman Empire, which wasn't even on the planet? Mm-hmm. How it would rise, how it would fall, how it would behave. All those things are so specific, only God could know them who knows time. Yeah, yeah. So, so how do I validate the truth of the scriptures? Well, I look at the prophetic value and I test it to see, is that true? Mm-hmm. Did that happen then? Mm. Um, and then, then I can rest assured that this, there's no book like this book. Yeah. So the doctor could, he's not, I don't think he's skilled in, in defending the veracity of the scriptures yet. He mm. needs to bone up on that. But uh, he could rest on view three, method mm. three. But when you're pursuing truth, methods one and two aren't bad either. Yeah. 
Now, now with truth, I want to talk about relativism because that's a topic that obviously yeah. comes up with truth and, yeah. and, you know, and, and relativity is a real thing, right? Like there's, you know, relative to the sun, we're moving really fast relative to cars on the parkway. We're sitting completely still. So what does relativity do to the truth? And, um, yeah, because I think a lot of people respond to truth and there's, there's less, I've seen people less of a refutation and more of an acceptance that that's true. And so is this, it's not so much, well, let me, let me, you know, challenge that. It's kind of, it's more of a, okay, well, that's fine. If you think if that's true for, you know, right. I got you it. know what I mean? Yeah. No, I totally I know what you mean. Mm. Um, so relativism, relativism is an extremely tenuous viewpoint to hold because it's, it's self-defeating it. Mm. philosophically. So it's claiming no absolutes exist, so therefore everything must absolutely be true. Mm -hmm. If everything's absolutely true, then nothing's false. <laughs> can you, wait, can you, <laughs> let's, can we break that down a little, little more? I'd love to hear that. So you said uh, relativism, everything's absolutely true if relativism is true. It's true to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's true to you. It must be true. Yeah. But if everything is true to the people from their perspective, mm. then nothing by definition is false. Okay. But we live in a world where we know things are false. Mm -hmm. So we all have what I would call a built-in baloney meter mm -hmm. that when you hear stuff, your register goes off and you're like, there is no way yeah. that is true because you know that some things are false. Mm. So you couldn't even know anything is, 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 if everything is true, how could you know it's true unless you knew the opposite of it? Mm. You would have to know the opposite of, of it for it even to make the claim that it's true. That's another problem with it. But it's self-defeating in the sense that relativism assumes that truth is relative to people or to groups. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an absolute statement. Yeah. So they, it, relativism defies absolutes, uh -huh. moral absolutes. Yeah. But it assumes moral absolutism to, for, to create its position. Mm. That makes it self-defeating. Yeah. That makes it not worth following. Yeah. Be, because it's, it's, it's grabbing from the tree that I pull my fruit off of absolutism mm. that I believe, yeah. and it's moving it over to their tree, and they're using it, but they're not claiming it. Mm. So relativism claims that truth is relative to people or to a person. Mm. Uh, absolutely, it's that's the position. Yeah, but that only works if that's the only way it works, is that... But, but that's self-defeating. Yeah. I mean, that philosophically is self-defeating. Yeah. You just assume to my position and prove to me that absolutes do exist, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's why I'm not a relativist. Mm -hmm. You know, Truth is true no matter how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to look at truth. There's uh, the correspondence view of truth we already talked about. Then there's the, there's the coherence view of truth. Mm -hmm. So the correspondence view of truth is, uh, I know this microphone is here, um, and it's not a projection of my mind because, um, well, I can test it. Mm -hmm. I, could, I can touch it, I could hit it. The sound guy would probably be upset if I did. <laughs> I could taste it. I could bite it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can do a lot of things to test to see if I could set it on fire. I can test it and, and verify to you, hey, this thing's really here. Yeah. Because it corresponds to reality. Mm -hmm. That That's a Christian view of truth. Mm -hmm. Tr truth has to correspond to the facts. Mm -hmm. Correspondence view of truth is our view. Coherent view of truth is a relativistic view of truth. Okay. So what a coherence view believes is... If I emotionally feel this is true for me, mm. it must by definition be true. And if I get enough of people together that hold my viewpoint, even though it goes against the cultural viewpoint, what they say is true, since we collectively cohere and believe this is true for us in our little mm. group, it is ipso facto true. Yeah. So the problem with that is if everybody coheres and has their own little groups of truth and they're all true even though they diametrically oppose each other mm -hmm. you end up with chaos mm -hmm. because nothing's true yeah now i'd love to play devil's advocate a bit for that what do you like i, I feel that we see the correspondence is the second one right what correspondence was, is the first, first one. one second one coherence was, is coherent. the second one okay and yeah so I feel like we see, you know, in, in the arts, for example, we see coherence truth where it's like, there's not really a specifically, this is objectively a good piece of art, this is objectively a bad piece of art. And there, I, 
that's its whole conversation. But what do you do? Like, how does that play into it in the, you know, like the arts or in music? Like we can say, you know, I love this band or I love this song. Like how does, because our emotions do inform what, what we value in, in certain lights. Right. But that's that's talking about beauty. Okay. That's not talking about mathematics. I mean, you know, a, a geometric theorem is a theorem. Mm-hmm. And you may not, you not, you might not like it. I didn't like memorizing them all in school, uh-huh. uh, but they are true. Yeah. So if you want to find, you know, uh, a measurement in a parallelogram, yeah. there are certain equations you have to do that are absolutely true that never change. To sit in class and go, well, hey, you know, I kind of emotionally having a moment here where mm-hmm. I don't feel that this theorem is really being fair to how I feel about it, and so I'm I'm taking a different viewpoint. Yeah, well, you're not going to pass that class. Yeah. Because your emotion, how you feel about it, doesn't doesn't alter the truth of the theorem. Mm-hmm. But if I'm yeah. looking at a piece of you know of a Rembrandt, you know, if I'm listening to a, a you know an etude by uh, Chopin, uh-huh. you know, if I'm listening to you know a heavy metal song with Van Halen, one of my groups, you uh-huh. know, uh-huh. if I'm listening to those, I might like those, and I might yeah, think yeah. they're great, and you might not think they're great. You might like other things. Uh, that's more a personal, uh, that's an opinion of how you appreciate something that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. But it still doesn't change the fact that, well, Chopin wrote this. Yes, mm-hmm. those are the notes that he wrote. That's exactly how he put those those runs in at that given point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it still corresponds to reality mm-hmm. that that piece actually exists um, and that that painting was made in such a way, painted with certain kind of paints, certain kinds of oils. The, the painting doesn't change. Yeah. So you might have a different a, emotional appealing of it, but doesn't change the truth that the painting's there mm-hmm. <laughs> or that the rock group is there. Yeah. Um, so so are, you, are you saying that like between there's there's truth and there's objectivity, right? And then there's beauty. So mm-hmm. how, like help me figure out where those things belong in categorizing those things, right? How do we, how do we know when to apply? Okay, let's just break it down to you like ice cream? Of course. Okay, so who doesn't like ice cream? Yeah. So uh, I was introduced to Blue Bell ice cream going to Dallas Seminary back mm. in the early 80s. It's the food of the gods. It's <laughs> unbelievable. So, um, and, but they don't make my favorite anymore, Tin Roof Sunday. I don't Ten know roof. what happened to that. What was on that? What was in that one? It was vanilla laced with chocolate and peanuts. Mm. It would Can't to- go wrong. It would, it would totally change your life. Yeah, dang. But uh, so they don't make that anymore. So Blue Bell ice cream now is sold here on the East Coast. Okay. Started a couple of years ago. It's totally cool. Um, so if you and I were going to the grocery store and look at a freezer full of bluebell ice cream, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to see all the cool flavors Yeah, and you're going to have your favorites and I'm going to have mine. Mm-hmm. That's just a personal choice based on taste, mm-hmm. et cetera. But one of us would be foolish if we were to say, Hey man, I, <laughs> I really don't think that the, the ice cream is really in, in the freezer section. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. just how I feel about it. Yeah. That's whole different. That's a whole different discussion than, um, than saying I like pistachio mm-hmm. or I like you know birthday cake ice cream. That's to, that's a personal preference of something that actually exists. Yeah. When you're looking at truth, it's is it there? Yeah. Do you see a tub of ice cream there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. If you're looking at me going. No, those, those, that looks like Oreo cookies to me. Mm-hmm. Well, then I got numbers you need to call <laughs> because uh, we're not, in my perspective, correspondence view of truth, there's tubs of ice cream sitting there, yeah. not tubs of ice cream and a couple of you know uh, packages of Oreo cookies sitting there, not unless yeah. somebody threw them in there. But yeah. if you're not, if what you're seeing doesn't match reality, that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. So personal preference on what you like yeah. is one thing but it doesn't change the truth of what's there. Yeah. Now, I think it's interesting because I think the the relativism right now is so much, I wanna have personal preference on the truth. Like I want the truth to be the thing that's in the, you know, in the freezer and I choose which one. And so like how, okay, how do so. we make sense of that? And how do we make truth not be different flavor? Like how do we, articulate truth in a way that doesn't seem like it's flavors of bluebell ice cream. It's like, no, this is ice cream or it's not, right? Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, so in philosophy, the first, when Aristotle studied logic um, and he didn't, he didn't create logical analysis, he discovered it. Mm-hmm. So 
in all logical principles, the first lo rule of logic, the law of non-contradiction is where you start. Mm. And it's the, it's the bedrock, bedrock of all thinking. So what it states is two things cannot be true at the same time and in the same sense. Mm. So there can't, I, we can't stand outside the freezer and I say, there's blue bill ice cream inside that freezer and you're looking at the same freezer going, I don't see blue bill ice cream in there. In mm -hmm. fact, I don't see any ice cream at all. Somebody's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Somebody is not telling the truth. Yeah. One view corresponds to reality, one does not. So you, you can't have um, all those claims being made at the same time and they're diametrically opposed. So you mm -hmm. can't open the door and go, oh, all those are options for truth. Uh, when it comes to morality, sex, gender, pick pick the topic. Mm -hmm. You know they're all free and loose, and they can be whatever they want to be, because that does that's not how the world works. Mm -hmm. There is claims made um, that there is this, and then there's this, and they're diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. How do I know which is the right one? Mm -hmm. There ha there has to be one that is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. You you could take it and change the analogy to gravity and say, you know. If I open up the freezer and it's like there's a box in there that says, you know, gravity and there's a one that says, well, there is no gravity. Mm -hmm. Well, it, one guy believes one, one guy believes the other. But if you go test them, mm -hmm. which is the correspondence view of re truth by standing on a three story building and you who don't believe in gravity. Yeah, that wouldn't end well. Yeah, I'll be at your funeral. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, you can emotionally believe that all you want. Mm -hmm. But based on law of non-contradiction, when you're looking at truth claims, mm -hmm. there's going to be they cannot be diametrically opposed and be and be true at the same time. It's mm -hmm. a, the world doesn't function that way. Yeah, you know, like you're sitting in a chair. Mm -hmm. If you were to tell me I'm not sitting in a chair, mm -hmm. defies reality. Yeah, you know, and so, but if you say you know, well that that's just how I feel. That's what I want to be truth for me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, you can you can believe that, mm -hmm. but. But I'm going to challenge you that I really think there's a chair there. Yeah, you know, so it's not a smorgasbord when it comes to truth because truth is always absolute. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's telling people, you know, to think through what what they're claiming. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, like the debate with transgenderism or mm -hmm. in, pick any topic. You know, to say there's. You know, one side says there's two genders and there's two sexes. The other side is, oh no, we we bifurcate you know gender from sexuality, and so we can have a hundred genders. Mm -hmm. And so that's these are two totally different things, two truth claims that are made at the same time based on Aristotelian logic. They can't both be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you have to test them. Yeah, and that's that's where you you arrive at which one matches reality, which one doesn't match reality. Mm -hmm. Because could could you apply that sense of truth and facts to beauty, and what like how how do we not apply it to beauty also? Maybe is the question I'm asking. Like how can I not how can we not say for example if I was like classic rock stinks, and you were like classic rock is the best. Like can we apply that method or is it beyond that method? So okay, so like in classic rock, if you think it, somebody think it stinks and somebody somebody likes it, it doesn't change the fact that there is classic rock. Mm -hmm. So somebody might say, you know, you know, there are two genders. Some might say there's a hundred genders, but it doesn't change the fact that there's two genders. Mm -hmm. okay. It's the same thing. Yeah. Why? Because it matches reality. It matches binary function, mm -hmm. how we're created. Mm -hmm. we're, we're made in a binary fashion to reproduce as the scriptures say. And, you know, it says in Psalm 139 that, that God has wonderfully made us individually. Mm -hmm. So he made a mistake. So, you know, once you start messing with your construction and you don't think that it's the right construction, you're challenging the very God who designed you mm. yeah. and telling him, I don't like how you designed me and I think you made me in, a, in an incorrect format. Mm -hmm. When you should be embracing the greatness of how he made you and enjoying it. Mm. But once you embrace a, a, a viewpoint that's not attached to reality, then anything's possible. Mm. And then that doesn't correspond to the facts. So you create your own facts build your own little group around you that will support you in your facts. And then you can rationalize your activities and feel great about yourself. Mm. But that's what people do in all, all kinds of areas mm. in all kinds of grouping with political, you know, mm. uh, you know, 
people who are liberal in politics, people who are conservative. I mean, mm-hmm. they build themselves in little groups. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, it's done across the board in all kinds of ways. Yeah, we love our tribalism. Huh? I said, we love our tribalism. Our brilliant this is, this is This is true, but mm. you know, is one better than the other? Mm. You know, is the question. So um, a person can be into, you know, I prefer this or prefer that, but it doesn't, it doesn't change it doesn't change what I am by reality, mm-hmm. you know? So um, truth has to match the facts, mm-hmm. you know, that there's a lot of things in our world that don't match the facts and we're, we're being told to believe them when we know they don't match the facts, mm-hmm. you know? And that's, that's the tragic thing of our culture mm-hmm. is they're wanting us to believe things that are lies when we know those positions be what they may defy truth as we know it because God built into the warp and woof of our being, understanding that truth is that which relates to what is. Mm -hmm. And and, and I can test it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear more, give us a follow and join us next week as we continue to talk with Dr. Marty Baker about why apologetics is important.